was thinking yesterday as well as on the day that we went to the trip, I was thinking that uh, I was thinking that I should have talked to the standards now rather than later, which is what I did last time. But maybe I should do it to a later date because I thought it would be nice to know all the signs before we go to the um, But then I was looking at the floor yesterday, then we trade because of the date, and I did not want to teach climate smart agriculture because I think that's one of the most important components of Pakistan and, and agricultural countries. So I thought maybe it'd be nice to to take pause and look at environmental impact assessment in general, and then hopefully never to um, looking at the stem. I think today we can double the CP. And so we can give those incentives to people who are in the class to make sure that that is yes, definitely. I still love the Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah. So I don't know if you remember the uh, the bio with a little discussion that we had about what happens to soils in general, more towards the pH or the, the acid scale, but it comes towards the acid base and oftentimes a lot of time and the pH down the time. Um, you know, but we're not saying that it is all anthropogenic, a lot of it is natural as well. Um, so, but, but then with the surface water, everything is tied in that part, our place. Uh, but regardless, for example, if you put in trays that are in the um, despite the fact that the water is such a big city and such a rich city as in gender, it doesn't have a simple uh, base water plan for the Right. What that means is that all the wastewater that is going to come out, coming out of the commercial and municipal sources is being dumped into surface water. Any subsurface treatment is available, which you now call drains. All of these drains carry all the mixed wastewater eventually to the So, for example, if you take the waste of So if you take a case of uh, uh, this, this is Rohimala, or the things called, also called Charity. Um, this then eventually goes to Hadiara. Now Hadiara is another stream that is coming from India to the hall. That, whatever that carries, let's say, whether that's agricultural wastewater, nitrates and phosphates, or if you get municipal wastewater, uh, that then comes in Pakistan. And initially, I remember when I came, a lot of discussion was around how India sends in Pakistan. But most of the studies that have been conducted in CP show that the water, the water that enters uh, Pakistan is actually much cleaner than the water that, that is found in Pakistan. And that is because we do not treat that as So automatically, we are contributing. Surface water pollution and then surface water pollution then uh, relates to soil pollution. The soil pollution relates to groundwater pollution, groundwater pollution, so active pollution, pollution, which is that, as we said, because it's such a slow process to recharge it, that is a non renewable resource. So if you degrade, degrade that natural capital, uh, that is kind of an irreversible uh, degradation is now. So we've lost the resource. Anyway, so I was telling everyone that we will be, but we, we discussed the groundwater. I hope that the reason I wanted to, you to do this is because you're going to do the whole thing, and that was about groundwater. So I just wanted you to be able to more sensitize about groundwater in general, groundwater pollution, not just in Pakistan, but in the US as well. And then again, also that it can be anthropogenic, but it, it equally can be natural as well. Um, 
um, about the levels. I don't know how many of you, if any one of you did um, a pilot about groundwater over extraction, feel free to yes, Roger. Yeah, and where exactly is that? Arkansas, Arkansas in the USA. Yeah, so it's it's not just to develop in world poverty. It's equally developed world poverty. But the um, the good thing about the developed world now is that they have put a lot of resources. Um, and I I used to tell the class last year that they have they they put a lot of resources every time they contaminate their groundwater resources. Um, they have put all kinds of research money chucked in to make sure that that area is. As we discussed, there's not a lot of light there, there's no sunlight there, so the typical process of degradation um, and rejuvenation doesn't really help underground. So they have to make sure that A, it is contained because it's difficult to trace it, um, and B, it is taken out, treated, and make sure that whatever the ground resources that you need. Okay. So let's get to environmental impact assessment. Have you guys ever, ever heard about uh, EIA? And do you have a reference for it? Any news, any project? Yes. Absolutely. So I, when I was taught environmental impact assessment, it was very theoretical, and I, I hadn't particularly enjoyed it. But in my undergrad, I interned with the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, and that is when I realized that if environmental impact assessments were carried out well, um, if projects and development agencies and let's say the consultants who run these things, if they actually cared about what they were doing, so many of our problems would not exist. Um, and so during the time that I was there, uh, if any of you, I'm sure most of you know about Centaurus. Um, Centaurus was under construction, so we used to go for the monitoring of the site through before EPA, and we used to create that the monitoring before EPA. Um, and do you think EIA environmental impact assessment happens before the project, during the project, or after the project? Before, from before the project until um, as long as the project exists, if it is a big, if it is a mega project, there has to be an environmental impact which is why I think EI is so important. Um, and, and I think I have put some, yeah. So this is this is a, a, a green humor created for India, but I don't think Pakistan's case is any different. Generally what happens is you, um, if you propose a site, so EIA should happen when the, a project is proposed, right? Because you go and look at the site and you look at the biophysical, the natural, um, you know, the impact on flora, fauna, culture, people, people, it's it's very people-centric. Um, so for example, we, we will come back and talk about some of the projects like um, Bujarnala, where uh, now people are, you know, the poor live close to the Nala and the Hockey, and they are being sent away. So their homes are being demolished. Um, and, and all of them, they don't have any other resource. So the little money that they're getting Composition that they're getting, they're not happy with it. But destroying their homes can happen before, you know, any consultation. So I think the fact that this sort of talks about the interrelation between the 
dynamic environment and the natural environment and make sure that people, uh, particularly marginalized people, do not get impacted um, is why, again, it's also really important. So in Pakistan as well, what generally happens is before the EIA is approved, so if I were to come and create something, like if I were to come here and build an industry next set alongside, I'll, I'll first come and, you know, I'll first propose the project with the pro proposition and scoping of the project should ensure that I come and speak with the university, because the university is a key stakeholder. I should involve the students. I might have to propose another site. I will. I might have to say that, you know, I, I would do X, Y, Z amount of land and building before I, I bring an industry here. And, and all of that has to happen before the, the project. But in the case of Pakistan, what generally happens is if there are trees that are cut down, um, everything's taken care of, construction is started, and then someone comes and says, where is your EIA? And by the time the EIA document starts preparation, the project's already underway, half the damage is already done. Um, and, and, and that's something that I think is, is not how EIA happens. Next level. Um, this is the EIA So the, um, there is like a polluter pay principle incorporated into the Oxide Environmental Protection Act, but the amount that a polluter has to pay or an offender has to pay is so minimal that it, it would probably be better for them to go and destroy it first. Because of course, if they are doing a mega project, they, they can afford it. Um, but instead of starting from scratch, if they end up like cleaning the site and then have to pay a penalty and then have to write it for. It's actually in their favor because they, then they can pay that minimal damage money or compensation, but the project has already started before and upon the state place. So the government would take a stay. The project will stop at that point, but the, because the project is already initiated, it's like a chicken and egg um, situation. But that's unfortunately how things happen um, in, in our part. But I'm sure that if we go zoom out a little bit, you must have also heard about ISO. Um, and probably like in some of the materials that you buy, they keep saying it's ISO certified. So have you ever thought what ISO certification is and, and why you would need that? So 
So ISO is like an international organization to set citation, which means that quality has to be assured. Um, so if, for example, Lance's building is ISO certified, it means that whatever like, minimal criteria there is globally for a building to be constructed for education or academia, Lance is get it. Or for example, mostly like industries, I'm sure that um, in the packages, I'm not sure if they mentioned ISO, but they did mention uh, OSHA, which is, which is something related to occupational health and safety. Um, so there are like different standards that they have to meet, but ISO is, is one that's quite, quite familiar and everyone's heard it uh, throughout their lives. So I, I just want to make sure that, that you are aware of it. And, uh, and with that, like, I wanted to give you a little bit of uh, a little bit of uh, like the, the way that, that, that it happens. It's, it's basically self regulation. And EIA is not that different from ISO either. So you say that you want to meet a certain standard that is set, then you set that standard for your organization, and then you have to meet the documentation. So if you have heard of ISO 9000 certification, um, there's a lot of documentation involved. So in terms of materials, construction, design, um, everything like there, there will have to be a check and balance that you have to be taken uh, to make sure that the quality is good. But if you remember in packages, they said we have our own targets. And I asked them, is it the environment, National Environmental Quality Standards or OSHA? They said, no, no, it's our own targets. So th those targets essentially are under these kinds of global situations where an organization has to set its own um, targets and meet them and plan and act and make sure that this something is continued. And it's not a one-time process, it's a lifetime process. So they'll have to ensure that throughout the year. So if the targets were to be updated, they would have to update it and then keep those and then keep checking and coming back. Um, and, and with that, I kind of wanted to mention ISO 14001, because ISO 14001 is now not just an assurance of quality, it's also an environmental management system. So regardless of the standards that are set by your local government, this is an international standardized set that is met by the organization. Um, and if they are ISO 14001 certified, it will probably give them a global access. So let's say if countries were to do ethical business, and, and I say that my organization is ISO 14001 certified, that means that whatever global targets there are for environmental management system, my organization is meeting. So it's it's also kind of a, a passport for the products that can be sent in and there. Just to make sure that things are, are done. So uh, although Roja said said some of it already, there are two uh, terms that you definitely need to know. One is international environmental, initial environmental examination and the other is environmental factor. IE is either a pre-EIA step or it is done for small projects. So let's say a small micro hydel bar project in my village would not require EIA because it's a minimal budget and it is in fact very small and localized. So I would only need an IE. But if I were to construct a bigger uh, dam, I would need maybe, and initially I can claim that doesn't need EIA, in which case I'd have to conduct an IE first, and then that IE will tell me whether an EIA is needed or not. Generally, the because the companies do not like to go through that step, so generally bigger projects just automatically get the EIA done while the IE is only conducted for small projects. So there's like a clear divide. So for example, in the case of uh, agriculture, smaller projects would would come under IE. For example, less than 50 megawatt for energy would come under IE, but anything above it would come under EIA. So the impacts are already quite, quite clear as well. Right. So this is the you know the same process that we were talking about. It, you, you just look at it, whether an IE is or EIA is required or not. And as we've been talking, we'll try to highlight a little more as well. We look at what the possible impacts would be. And how can that be mitigated before we start the project, during the project, and even after the project ends as well? And, and 
as I said, there has to be public involvement at, at all steps, whether that's the scoping of the project. So you can't design a project, get it approved by the government, and then, then tell the public that, by the way, we're doing this project. Public has to be involved in this scoping as well, at least the people who are going to be impacted by it. And then eventually, like the review, which is when your EIA report is submitted, then every stakeholder is invited in. The academia is invited in, the industry is invited in, the governments are invited in to make sure that uh, public involvement is there and that the project is approved properly. But what is the purpose of it? Why do you think we, we do it? Because we want to make sure that whatever development project that there is, it doesn't create a lot of impact. In fact, if it does, we make sure that we minimize the impact of it. Because as we know, as a powerful, powerful species that we have emerged, we, we're not going to stop our development because it's not good for the environment. Uh, we've seen that we just continue to grow uh, with every passing day. So this is a legislative requirement for us to be sure that if we must grow, then we also have to make sure that the impact is minimal uh, or entirely eliminated. So there have been projects that are shelved projects that have very high impact that, that, that get shelved because they do not prove that they will be able to do it. Ah, yes. It's both. So that's like the beauty of the uh, environmental impact assessment because I like, because it, it not only is a social environmental assessment, it's also a, so it considers human beings as part of the environment. So our built environment is something that I think requires EIA more. Some natural setups rules, right? But as we've seen, we, we, we highly care about, you know, what's happening to the natural environment where there is no development project. So mostly EIA is just done for a development project or construction project that is happening in any part of the world. So because it's like not natural environment, the built environment automatically is us for building it. And then it's, it's some, Strike out features that will be impacted, it then becomes very So it's both social and economic. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't hear you. So that's a very good question, and that's where the trade-off is. I think a lot of times people have agreed to development projects because it has economic benefits for the community. Um, and in that case, um, sometimes environmentalists stand up, so, so movements would stand up to make sure that people are aware. So for example, if you looked at the, um, I, I think Marriott or PC in, in, in near Atabha, they were going to build uh, this is already approved by EIA. Some people are already happy that a five star is going to be built near Atabad Lake. But um, some of us, including myself, we asked where the EIA report, because the EIA report has to be made public. Um, and, and some of us asked where the EIA report was, because we think we want the information of the project to be damaging for the environment and shut down the environment. Do renovation and expansion projects also in the EIA place? They would if they are mega projects. If, if the, let's say it's like a small extension, they probably just need to put it in their environmental monitoring plan because they're bound by law to update the EPA about what they've done and how the project's created. Um, so if, if it's like an extension, there would either need to be an IED for that small project if it's small. Otherwise, they'll probably have to um, tell the government. But, I think it's a, again, like these things are really tricky because people can start with, with smaller projects and then keep expanding once they have a nice understanding with the EPA. Um, and EPA folks, and I don't blame them, almost always try to facilitate development organizations because in the end, they know that they can't stop a lot of people. But I do know that, for, for example, in the case of Centaurus, some of the floors were reduced because um, it, it didn't meet the requirements. So they, they couldn't go that high uh, because Islam uh, itself had some regulation of what, what would the limit of high rise be. So they were asked, and they had 
of course, made a lot of expenses on the base of the building. So that every infrastructure was built such that there would be more floors and more income, but they have to rooms in that place, but they agreed. So generally, like they just put uh, put it on the news. And how many of us do think it's all? It's the public supposed to be told how where things happen. Um, that is generally done through um, newspaper, and then you also see it on the site. And then some of the uh, stakeholders are also invited. For example, if as an epidemic, I added to the list of people, they would send both the um, EIA report as well as a notice of the public hearing. Um, otherwise, like most of the people who do not engage with EPA wouldn't know what's happening. Uh, but the only source of public notification is the news. Um, news itself that, that people probably don't even see. So this is for Karachi, yes. So EIA2 is a global down. So for example, India would have its own EIA regulations. It's all environmental agencies that monitor and conduct EIAs, their own customers. So they'll be more uh, localized, but the system, of course, is involved in doing this way. So even there, I think most often they just go hand in hand. Um, so I think EIA is more important for them to meet the local standards, but the local standards will be more strict. And in that case, they would have to. Um, and I'll show you when I show you the standards of how uh, between the WHO and uh, another strict. So the WHO and US UK standards. Um, and then our standards is just somewhere between. So that's if we just decided to support Titan, that's not how it's done. That's not how it's done. When you see it, that it, it makes sense that there's no standards. But I do remember that when the standards came, they were a little more strict. And then later, I think around 2008, um, a committee said again, and they said that we don't think it would be possible for us not to meet those strict requirements. So they were relaxed. The so they are subject to the national office. And in the end, all EIA has to do is meet the national standards. All right. Um, okay, so this is um, the. Pakistan Environmental Protection Act that I was talking about, which then has national market quality standards, which we will also study um, as a part of this. And then I said, let's look at the regulation. Do we need to look at the regulation? I'll, I'll send this slide to you so you can look at the regulation as well. Um, there is a lot of there was a lot of description associated with this, so I do not want to get into the details of what each part entails and what should be there. IE and EIA are not too different from each other. So the outline of uh, an EIA would also be similar, except that it would be more detailed because the project and its scale would be huge. Whereas for IE, it would be simpler and short. Um, so for example, if for a project, the project IE is 30 to 70 page, for an EIA, it would be 100 to 500 pages, depending on the time. So yeah, you describe the project, you describe the national environment. Um, as well as built environment. Then you look at the impacts, you talk about how you will mitigate those impacts. Um, then you also have to include an environmental monitoring plan, which means that how and when and how frequently you can monitor uh, and meet those. Public consultation, like I said, is key. Information has to be available. It has to be on public resource. So if there is an, a construction activity happening in your neighborhood, you should be able to go to the EPA site and expect the IE or EIP project and avoid projects. If it's not there, you can still go and find it in their shell because every EP has a library and all of these IEs and EIS go into their library. So if you want to go back and look at the project that happened, for example, 10 years ago, even though they might have taken it down from the website, you can go and find it. 
if an industry committed to, to, to an EIA or, or a plan and then initially you could not see any damage, but eventually you see that something's going on, that means that whatever monitoring plan that they had or whatever mitigation measures they proposed, it's actually not happening at that particular point, in which case you can either sue the company or go to EPA and complain about what you're doing. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's a good question. So I was asking whether, um, so it's not just for people, that, so the public doesn't only need to cover that directly in the public doesn't that the internet in the public is also, um, like they're also entitled to all this information as well. So they have, the, that's what the scope they should take, should make sure that how, for example, indirectly you who are living many miles away from the project would get impacted if the water that is treated is dumped into a water body that you can actually find its way to um, So, not only I who live right next to the industry is entitled to the information, but you as an indirect uh, public or potentially impacted public also are entitled to that information. I think the information is more jarring and it's more like, like everything else, it's more just to make a paperwork and kind of requirements and regulations. It's not really written for the public even. So, so here's the thing, if I'm an industry, I would carry the EIA, but I wouldn't directly be there on the ground. I would hire a consultant, which would be you. So you will be my case. Your job is to just get the money that, that you need from for that system from me and get done with it right time. My job is to make sure that you, that, you know, I give you enough money to write on project, I make sure that you go and consult with the public. I make sure that you really report to your religion so that you want experts to know from that doesn't say you haven't spoken to this or that or you haven't spoken to this to the back community. And so again like where is the like why would you care about the long term impacts if your job is that you just write the IE or the IE for the um, and why would I care about the public if I don't have more information about Sometimes some public hearings get really, really ugly, um, and we will come to the um, Ravi River Front Development, Urbanization Development Plan that is now, it's, it's sort of expanding the whole, like adding another is now part of the park. Uh, but the difference is that they're not building another DHA, they are building a word. So they're building it such that everything will be close. So the offices would be there, the schools would be there, everything would be within that uh, periphery of a, of a city that's being built. Add it to Lahore, and then they, they would also make sure that you know it's an independent body of its own, but they also make sure that they do not too much and even though they are too much. Um, and, and we will look at how the idea of apps does the portion. The people will not, people will try to make sure that the report is well written, so that at least the experts do not come up to them um, and ask them why this or that or that. Um, it is thorough that most of the EIs and IEs that they are well written. But uh, they, they do not care. They, you know, that's also true that they are, if they have the liberty to not do, I don't think any any particular housing authority or industry would do I E or EIA because they care so much for the people and, and the environment that that wouldn't happen because they've always prioritized their comforts over everything else. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, oh, but maybe there are. You know, I know of someone who built a who was who wanted to build a mining site in in Abuja and built a whole road. Without even scoping the project, like he created a few things that we eventually beneficial for the community. 
Because the community now that it says it's not working, that they own and they can actually have it different people. But once he went to the site, he realized that the site section not suitable, it's not very much important, there's not enough marble there. And so he just left the site and went. So he had built this uh, billions of bucks on these roads. Because so sometimes there are people who, you know, he could have just gone and done that initial study first instead of building the whole world, but he did the whole world and he said, okay, if it was not in my, um, you know, if I was going to get it, I wasn't going to get it, but he did not come back to the public and said, gave so much money. So there are good people as well uh, who don't just look for their own benefits, but also see whatever activity they are doing for the world. Yeah. Or not. So I think it's just slightly on the policy after. 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 To put it right in his prediction of forecasting, or how do we want to put it? Both the projects would initially just sit down and forecast. Yeah. IEB, after monitoring plan, IEB, and that's really good because it's a small project. Generally, after that, the agencies wouldn't come up. Yeah, it's a bigger project. In some cases, if the project is bigger, uh, but you know, let's say I'm building a um, see rubber uh, plant in farm where I'm building a back extraction system, which I'm not just trying to achieve, but maybe I would need some kind of uh, uh, approval from the government and I would get it. But we could not even just get to where the NFC as well. I'm sure you might have heard that somewhere where they don't even do IE. We just go to the local government, we just go to the local public, and they say we have no objections to the government and on with it. Um, but, but there are some big projects that may not have as much impact as, as the other projects, and in which case the, the scale might be huge. Uh, but I wouldn't be sure whether I should conduct an IE for this or the other. So I'll start with IE. Then, if the IE tells me that actually, because now I'm bringing the hard trucks to this. Site, I might need to do it here because as my project expands, I might need to construct something as well. So my long-term plan for the project go then and the public. So for IE, you do not need public hearing and then you can sign the public hearing. You just notify about the project. Um, you just make the information available, but you don't have to do any public consultations like this. For EIA, you have to have uh, those public consultations. Which should be attended. There's an academic to this as well. In terms of timeline, I'm concerned about the project, and there is a timeline, which is not always met, but then generally the construction body they push for the project to be as soon as possible, but EPA also has timelines for example, which is a major report who will respond to so in one month or five days. How true is that because they, they won't send it to any time, like for example, if they send it to you, would I have the time to go through the whole document? So sometimes, you know, there is a timeline that it is not met, but the development organization will make sure that or they need to make sure that that is done. So they will be coming back to the when we when are we going to, to get this done. Um, but generally, I think powerful people are able to navigate you know, more easily than complexity. And again, I did not want to, for example, here. You see this this part is the something that probably be important for, for this course. I will I come to I just uh, endless these and people can look at the slides so that's really lazy trying to make it attractive so it's just as as it is. So the physical, ecological, economic, social and culture, all aspects of the project have to be covered in the description of the project. Um, it's not just the physical economics, so not just the atmosphere, not just the talk about the Sorry, not just the water, but also other things, and then also the economic infrastructure. So it could be, for example, that the development project actually brings a water or a gas pipeline that would benefit the community that otherwise did not have access to those resources, which can be highlighted in the economic development. And most of the projects that get away with, with some of the damages when they if, if, when they do this. Because a lot of development projects will buy the indigenous communities away, but there are other projects that say, well, 
why we bring the gas pipeline for example, from A to B in the way there are these 10 communities that have access as well, and so automatically they have more ground components than any other organization. Do you have that? So, Sare, Jimmy, he had a short term, medium term, or long term. Sare, in fact, some of them are present. Or mitigation measures may be short term, medium term, or long term. Sare mitigation measures in Pelic. Now, you are searching it, go in short case, carrying it. Bahape EPA Karula. EPA, Apishat's not yoga industries may EPA. Random inspection to look at. So, if it as an industry, if I have said that my textile industry more, I know that my waste is very toxic. But I have installed an MDR plant which is waste water to treat it. So, 24 hours, 24 hours a day operational. So, EPA can see the random hour. They can inform inspections to look at. And most of the inform work are unfortunately low. All the things up and running, but they have random inspections. Uh, because otherwise it's possible for them. But let's say if it was a random inspection and they come to my industry and then they see the hurt is good for say or here, for example, if rent packages, most of that can see them aware of the IHLA giant. And then we see like all the ink, all the you know, the smell being double uh, the amount that it was when we were there. Um, as you could see, some of the things were not running when we were there. They said we have switched it off. So respect to that you can do intentionally put, put something out to go um go ensure that not in case in the matter it's regulatory bottom is in line with them um but if you have a share of it may uh projects and if you want to keep this with it like what is my point for what robust mechanism might be done um so sometimes they just do i i actually also remember a time when not not my group but another group went to a very big industry in Islamabad. And uh, when the team went in, even if there was a lock that they had to sit, and they weren't facilitated. So people also threaten um, regulatory agencies, right? It's not always the Apolecta or Kibara inspector situation of the agency, everyone's just serving the team. Sometimes they also threaten. Huh. Unless, but it depends on that. Everyone is then maybe that that's when the concept of ethics comes here. If you committed to something, you're ethically and of course legally, legally more than ethically bound to do it. Whether you do it or not, because if you start any back threats in the job center, um, maybe the communities around can always or actually you take a community show much up because after the cast of this industry say smell me I give a smell area. So oftentimes like those complaints drive those things but after the Pakistan the people also make peace for the fact that my district of Australia is spent while fine I get uh this is my mother used to say in the wash over that the travel in the party that that not be based on the air so maybe we get to see how what the hell to put that in the in the work here you know it's people saying it's okay we know that it's there is a little funny boy and some people even used to say that rather like a bit on top but they absolutely leaks and fight me he was higher cost where i'm about to be when she has to talk to you one night and you will have to talk to you which is not like it's using hand to the public is both bothered and sometimes not you know done tired doesn't care because they know not the same thing yeah So I think so that, that's again like a, I think it's a very good question. So I was just saying that packages variably that are um, solvents for the mind, but how is it that they now uh, are installing the capture for, for that 
and decide to build a big project, then he will have to make sure that if he's saying that the impact is short term, or let's say in the baseline study, where he's saying what he's describing the environment. So in the section C of his EIA, he'll say, you know, that the, he'll go to one of these labs and make sure that if the soil quality, water quality, he can analyze the analyze method. Just, just to be, uh, so I put the definitions here. Uh, I, I, I thought this was important. I was confused whether I should put it or not, but I think because we've done enough talking, it might be nice to uh, to look at some of the methods. And, and the methods can be very, very dirty and cheap. So you just you know go on a random day uh, to the site and speak with the people and then say we've consulted the public. Or they can be very, 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 very advanced where you spend a lot of money, gather a lot of data, and are able to create models and and simulate and what methods again are not very different. And there you just go and decide, you know, it doesn't have to have experts. Anyone can walk in with a little bit of information, um, write a recent report and be done with a spoken of or screening of the project. Um, checklists again are very simple. You, you create a list, you go to the people, you say, I could get a test up to one, you try to go yes, or if you miss it, and you know, you come back. 10, 20, 30 or those, you have to compile the list and then you will show it in your report that we spoke with 40 people who are going to be impacted by this, but the mechanism isn't as robust. But at least there is some something. Um, I personally really enjoy seeing matrices because it shows the environmental parameters on one side and the development parameters on the other, and it shows the relationship uh, between the two. And I'll show you some examples. Network systems, but I'll, I'll show examples in the neighborhood if you get it. I'm sure you've seen a lot of models on climate science, et cetera, that, that tell you that how big data can give you big information. So all of those tools, depending on how big the, the project proponent is, it can be um, you know, it can be simple or complicated. So for example, here is a checklist. So I just say Surface water, air quality, is it going to is it pesticide free? Will there be fertilizer use? And I say yes, there will be fertilizer use in the water, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it could be event. So for example, this is for project activities. Uh, it depends on who's designed it. And sometimes, for example, if I give you the task to design something here for a project, for an imaginary project that you were to build right next to lungs, you could create these checklists yourself. How many trees would be destroyed? Would trees be destroyed? Oh, yes, no, how many, blah, blah, blah. And then that is basically your project uh, description and just a simple checklist of the things that are happening. But they're generally presented very, as you can see, um, in a nice way for people to, to know what's going on in the project. So this is a matrix. Just like I told you, there is, you know, what are the actions? So the development actions and the environmental factors. So, um, for example, we can look at land use, and it's saying land would be impacted by all these activities that are being carried out in the project. So if there's excavation, if there is, um, for example, creation of base for the building, um, if there's more agriculture activity, of course, if they're cementing it, that automatically means that the groundwater will not be permeated anymore, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and again, like the same thing, but this time I want to show you how a matrix has been created from some of the environmental quality parameters uh, that we study. So um, let's say the DO, and then it's saying in the project design phase, project construction phase, and project completion, how will the dissolved oxygen of the water body impact? And then they have created a key, like a lot, long term, short term, the things that we were talking about, no impact. Etc. And then I, I, I personally like uh, matrices in, in EIS. So I'm going to give you an assignment of this. Then there comes EI, uh, the GIS, which we have talked about, and how you can create certain layers. Um, and so, you, for example, if you create a se separate layer for the three areas, you'll create a separate layer for the soil type, you'll create a separate layer for topography. So when you combine those layers, 
what would happen is that if the topography is changing, so let's say the natural topography had a terrace, and then now you have bulldozed it, and let's say laser leveled it, and the topography is changed. This overlay will show you that what was the natural topography has now changed into a, a, a level. Uh, and so they try and combine it. It could be a water box. So, for example, in the project, in the floods that recently happened in 11 in Samba, it happened because they had filled all the um, uh, drains or all the stormwater drains that were there. But then, because they filled it and made a lot of constructions, once water was, uh, the watershed was compromised, automatically there was no flooding. But let's say if when the housing project had taken place and they had, for example, one layer for the flood rate of the project, this could have been uh, shown in the overlays method that this is the flood plane and the project is not compromising on the natural pathways. So like with a simple visual, they can they can look at the impact and they can also recommend the mitigation measure for the impact. And similarly, like you can build networks, 10 things are going to impact Flora, 12 things are going to impact Fauna and Fauna and so on. I really like this, and I think a lot of people use it in labs as well, specifically uh, in the engineering departments. It's called, so we talked about systems, and we talked about loops, and we talked about feedbacks, which could be positive or negative. This is essentially that diagram. Um, it's telling you, for example, that um, it, it for, it, it's not really for an area, but let's say if it was a project, then water availability. So with a project, for example, the water demand would increase and the water availability would decrease. But then let's say the project is claiming that we're actually going to supply water. We're going to bring water um, to this place. So that would increase the water. Availability. So the project would prove that even though the demand is increasing, and that is going to decline the water availability. We are also bringing an additional supply. And so that's how that impact will be mitigated. So you like this is like a very nice way to, to bring everything and it's called um, the systems method. Okay, so I have how much time do we have? Very little time. 15 minutes? Okay. So maybe I can give you the time now to uh, to open your cell phones. Do not use WhatsApp. Look at some of the EIS online. A lot of EIS should be available online. So just open any EIA report that is there. Uh, I've given you examples. You can you can go and uh, look at that. And in the meantime, we can talk about uh, the Rally Riverfront project, which I've just talked about, which is adding a, a city to the existing university. Um, and this is what they're so on the rally, they're going to they're going to build something like this, and like I said, it will be vertical flow and not um, otherwise not like the THS are very different, very concentrated offices, commercial areas, everything should be here. On that side, like on the left side, um, there is a farmer. So this is like an agricultural land right now. Uh, so the farmers have come and are protesting that this is before the uh, public credit. Project. And again, this is the same sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. So, Rale Riverfront Urban Development Project, I think it's called Pula or something. Um, so, that's that. Which will, and by the way, their own EIA says that if you look at it, I don't know if you can see it now, but if you look at it when you're reading it, a lot of these um, impacts they're saying are irreversible. So, whatever damage that they're causing, they're saying it's irreversible. Um, and still the project is going on. So you can see that how sometimes the reports are written for the projects. And of course it was inaugurated by the Prime Minister because he favors such kind of work for the um, Anyways, before we talk about that, I would just request you because I don't want you to ask too many questions when we actually ha happen to be doing the assignment. So I uh, look at any EIA report in your, uh, in your phone, uh, on the laptops, and then uh, look at how it's written and which project it is written for. Um, so, for example, I can show you one from here. 
much, much of it again. <laughs> Right. So this is LDA's uh, construction of single signal free corridors. Uh, I hope most of you have your own open, but for example, if I could just put on the slide that here's how it starts with an executive summary. In the introduction, you have a description, for example, the role of EPD. Uh, how would those mitigation me measures be implemented? Uh, the project description, as we said, and then we can go and look at one sections. For example, we can go and look at this. They're talking about environmental standards and guidelines. So the EIA requirement, then all the national environmental quality standards, and then you know the toxic and hazardous waste. And they'll probably talk about. Um, so this is what's happening. This is what legally they're required to do. And then this is the baseline environmental data. So they have to go and see what the parameters are what's the quality of life, what's the geography. So they've done it for this project. And then hopefully they probably have talking about the impacts and mitigation as well. Um, and now when you look at any EIA, I hope you're able to look at how they've done it and what methods they've used and how extensively that is done. Uh, and then with that, I think I'll come back to the, uh, the assignments. So yeah, hold on. So maybe with that, I can uh, just take a few questions. <laughs> 